Hi, Amanda. Hi, Bula. Hello. Hi, Andy. Hi. Andy. Hi. Thank you very much for joining me today for this uh, short interview. Uh, Amanda, Bula, can I ask you to... In, in, to Amanda first? Um, I'm Amanda Takavarasha. I'm a social care team manager working for Suffolk County Council and I work in the Berries and Edmonds area. Um, I'm Bula Chizimba. Um, I work in uh, the clinical commissioning groups in Suffolk and uh, I am the designated nurse for children in care, uh, for care leavers and for uh, unaccompanied asylum seeking children. Fantastic. Both know, all three of us know, we, we were due to have Tendai as well here to represent the, the secondary sector, so the health sector, the hospital, but uh, Tendai can't make it today. So um, I've got three questions that I'd like you both to answer each. Um, and the first one is this. So I, let's start with you, Amanda. Um, how, how have you been looking after yourself during the pandemic? Thank you, Andy. Um, so it's been a rather intense time, I think, is, is the word I can use for everyone. Um, and I am a team manager. I've got a team of 12 people who I manage. Um, so in addition to looking after myself, I um, also had to be mindful of my team's well-being. Um, in terms of how we how we cope as a team, we had to rapidly change the way that we would normally do things. So in the office, um, when we worked from the office, I could keep an eye on people. I could tell if people were feeling um, maybe not their best that day, maybe they, they needed a chat and it's quite um, easy to just walk over and ask them, are you okay? Um, but we quickly had to change things to enable me to catch up with people on a daily basis. Um, so we went from having one meeting a month um, to having daily catch-ups as a team. Um, I went from having monthly supervisions with each person to a one-to-one -one, um, with each team member every week. While that was quite intense, I think it was necessary just to keep on top of things and to make sure um, I was monitoring my, my team's well-being. We also did, did some informal things like um, crochet sessions, which was so much fun. It was probably, I haven't laughed so much in a long time, just trying to do a virtual crochet session where one, one member of my team showed us how to do it. And it was just, it, it was a train wreck to begin with. Um, but some of us have really loved it and carried on with it. Um, we also have some informal coffee catch-ups where it's, as a rule, we don't talk about work. So we just talk about anything and everything, pets, uh, hobbies, whatever it is. Um, I've also had to remind my team to book annual leave. I know there's, you can't go anywhere exotic at the moment, but um, it's also important to, to keep an eye on um, that and, and take some time off. Um, and we had some well-being sessions where we spoke about the impact of the pandemic and being isolated and some maybe not not so constructive habits um, like maybe not exercising as much so we d developed uh, some accountability buddies so to speak so I struggle with um, motivation to it buddied up with somebody in my team who exercises a lot, for example, um, and people who struggle with maybe not drinking enough buddy up and remind each other, that sort of thing. Um, and personally, I have tried to, well, just, just make sure I take time off. It's quite easy to be logged in till quite late in the evening. Um, and one thing that hit me the hardest, I think, throughout the pandemic, which was hard enough as it is, is the um, the disproportionate impact of COVID on um, black people, uh, in particular Africans, um, which was quite scary and overlaid with, um, I think it was compounded by the Black Lives Matter crisis, which um, I found myself compelled to speak out and I found it quite traumatic in a way because um, everything that was going on already with that on top of it was, was quite difficult. Um, I wrote about the stress associated with speaking out. Um, I wrote about um, how I felt and so forth, which has now led me to be involved in quite a few other things like the What Are We Missing um, project. And, and um, it's... It's been intense is all I can say. Um, so self-care, Biula <laughs> always reminds me about self-care. So I've met some amazing people through that, like Biula, I didn't know Biula before that. So um, Ant and I as well. So we, we come together and remind each other to, to bear that in mind. And some good friendships have been quite helpful as well with that. 
That's fantastic. And great to hear uh, your um, dedication to your team and uh, and your eye for uh, ensuring that their well-being doesn't go unnoticed. Uh, and I'm when, when you mention more drink, I'm, I'm assuming water. Then. Water. <laughs> yeah, we won't remind each other to drink more gin. <laughs> but yes, water throughout the day. <laughs> um, and we'll come back to those other uh, issues around um, Black Lives Matter and uh, what are we missing uh, in this interview. Thank you. Beulah, what about yourself? Thank you, Andy. Um, I, I, uh, well, firstly, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I, I suffered a personal loss uh, in the death of my sister in the first phase of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I, I think I've had to think about self-care in a very different way to address the gaps in the process of my own grieving and the grieving of my family that became apparent because of the lockdown. So, you know, in it's interesting because we're talking a lot about how the COVID-19 has um, pandemic has impacted on, on, on um, ethnic minority families. And in specifically for me and my family, we've been uh, impacted in, in the fact that some of those cultural um, activities that are, are part of our resilience building and part of how we how we cope um, when you know when we face stresses stresses or shocks to 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 how we how we live how we are as human beings and African Africans living you know in the diaspora so it's it's been quite an eye opener and interesting that you know we we haven't been um, we, we weren't able to meet up in in large groups to 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 you know grieve together have our wakes because uh, having a wake um, is is are things that are very uh, normal and part of our culture. So that that really made me start to think about how to look after myself a little bit more. I have I'm part of a fantastic team uh, in in the CCG. So my colleagues have been um, you know a real pillar of support for me while I have been unable to actually um, be physically with a lot of my family members who are dotted around the country uh, in England. So that has been quite a, a, an eye opener and an interesting journey for me. But I was able to recognize that I needed to address the gap uh, with alternative solutions to support myself and my resilience and to see this pandemic through. I think, um, you know, I realized quite quickly that we're going to be in this for a long haul. So I, I quickly took up the bereavement support that has been offered for all families needing bereavement support across uh, the Suffolk and Northeast Essex uh, patch. I think for me, um, you know, I felt that this was something I wanted to personally do. And, and the reason why I'm talking about it as well is because, you know, culturally, sometimes it is very difficult for people from um, ethnic minority backgrounds to reach out for this kind of support um, because it's different. Uh, we normally rely on on each other, on on our family members. We, you know, we get together, we talk, we remind each other uh, about uh, um, our bere our lost loved one, and talk about stories of them growing up together. So those are things that help us to uh, overcome some of our, uh, you know, our loss and our difficulties. But I realized that I really needed to speak to somebody because I was quite, um, you know, um, close with my family members. And, and specifically, you know, my sister dying um, in in this way is something that was sh I was shocked actually to hear the news. So I, I needed I recognize that I really need to speak to 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 somebody and, 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 and reach out and get that support. So I'm quite grateful that the CCGs um, quickly placed this, in, you know, this support in place for communities in our patch. Um, I also wanted to talk about, you know, the re uh, how I've reduced the unwanted noise from media and listening to sources of information I could trust, which were the official NHS public health messages. I think uh, uh, Amanda alluded to this in terms of, you know, everything coming through the Black Lives Matter. You know, these were important conversations. Um, but for me, it, it, it was interesting that, you know, there was so much media uh, stuff that ended up being quite negative. And I think I needed to just have some space 
where I wasn't thinking and bringing in things that I really didn't want to think about at that moment because I was grieving for my sister. So, you know, really choosing what to listen to. That was something I did deliberately. So I actually came off social media for a month, um, but only kind of, you know, logged into those channels where I could always stay up to date with some of the COVID news and the things that I needed to know from my workplace. And so a lot of the comms from my work uh, was something that I continuously managed to catch up with to keep myself in the know. I also regularly exercise. This was something that um, I said to myself, I needed to look after my emotional health and my mental health and physical health. So I did a lot of that, uh, which was really good for me. I met up with a lot of my colleagues online. That was really good. I did take some time off uh, uh, work uh, through annual leave, uh, as well as um, some of uh, uh, bereavement uh, leave as well. So that was really good. But I, I, I think my colleagues really stepped up for me. And the fact that I had colleagues who were very much in tune with what was going on for me was, you know, I, I really appreciated that. And I think at this time uh, in the pandemic, we can see how people have stepped up for one another. And it's it's been really heartwarming and, and, and um, something to be proud of. I think I'll end, I'll end at that note. Yeah, please, um, first of all, please accept my condolences um, uh, for your loss. Okay. And um, what you've described is, um, sadly, a situa situation too many people have found themselves in and, and will continue to, to do so. Yeah. Um, but you've also added to it um, that factor of certain cultures um, feeling the impact of COVID uh, through a bereavement process, through, grieving, uh, through um, grief, um, far more so than, than others. Um, hopefully at some point you'll be able to as a family really meet together uh, and remember your sister um, but you've also covered other other very important points about being flooded with news and negativity uh, and choosing where you where you seek that information and when you seek it you've talked about uh, support from your colleagues um, and you've also both of you talked about the, the important need to take time off as well because uh, other people I've interviewed have, have said that there's almost a, a guilt, a feeling of guilt to take away yourself from something that's concerning a pandemic where you, you almost uh, feel that, uh, that you need to be there 24-7 and of course you can't be. Thank you both of you for that really insightful start. Thank you. Um, the second question is this. Uh, uh, I'll go to you, Amanda. How has your work and, and that of your colleagues had to adapt during COVID? Um, so the biggest change I suppose that came with um, COVID is that we had to socially distance, we had to work from home um, and with that also came the need to adapt the way we do our job because we rely heavily on face-to-face um, -face contact with customers on um, home visits in order to gather the information we require to assess need and risk. Um, so we also had the Coronavirus Act 2020, which introduced certain easements and suggestions in terms of how we adapt our work. Um, the, the biggest, most obvious thing that's changed is the digital um, response and Suffolk County Council were absolutely great at immediately resolving. Um, we, we had some issues in, in terms of direct access. We had really poor connection to begin with. You would click on something, go make a coffee, come back. But within days that was sorted. They, um, the, they widened the access and, and that was really, really good. And they were so responsive, our IT department, which was really helpful. Um, and also in terms of not being able to go out to see customers, we were able to quickly find ways to um, have video contact with our customers instead and their families um, and to be able to assess people over the phone. To, uh, and we also had to introduce some home visiting risk assessments. So this was not just to protect ourselves, but pr primarily to protect the people that we work with. So us going out to them and seeing them face to face um, would introduce a risk potentially to them. And, and we have a, a large um, population of people who are over the age of 70, which is the identified um, sort of age group, I suppose. So we, we, we had to use PPE if we absolutely had to go out to them, but um, mostly doing things over the phone and um, over 
um, video calling. We also rely on wider um, networks for, for information. So rather than just going out, seeing somebody gathering all the information, we had to be more creative um, as to how we gather that information, particularly around undertaking mental capacity assessments. We had to rely on information from multiple sources, which has enhanced the way that we work anyway. And there's a lot to be kept from that. Um, some difficulties obviously arise. So for example, when, when we work with people who hoard or people who have environmental risks within their properties, we do rely on our senses. What, do we, what can we smell? What can we see? What are we experiencing in that environment in order to fully appraise that level of risk? And um, some of that was, was missing. So um, our safeguarding service, again, very responsive. They introduced um, the, the need to contact all our customers who have been identified as having a high risk of hoarding, um, because that comes with a, a risk, a, a fire risk, for example. Um, so we, we looked at where those risks might be and um, focused our energies on making sure the people at the highest risk um, were were spoken to. We also rag rated all our everybody on our caseload, and that was. It was a massive exercise, hundreds and hundreds of people um, on our in our awaiting trays and in our review trays, which meant we it was a very fast thing that we had to do because we needed to know who was out there with minimal support um, who may not be able to call upon somebody. And at the beginning of COVID, we we. We were expecting the worst, really. So, um, you know, it felt a bit ap apocalyptical. So we, we had to really, um, ex you know, plan for, for, for the potential worst. Um, and also we, we had um, a lot of feedback from our senior management who've worked exceptionally hard um, in relation to business continuity and they've been very responsive. So on an almost daily basis, we had um, updates about what to do. It was quite exhausting in that we had to change our recording, we had to change um, a lot of what we did and how we did it. Um, so it was very intense to begin with and we, we um, had to learn new processes very fast. But what we saw quite interestingly was that we had a massive dip in referrals, a, a, a massive lull um, across the board, including safeguarding. Um, which we, we then had to explore why why might that be? Where is the demand going? But I think some of it is quite obvious. People may not have wanted to to introduce further risk into their homes by asking us to intervene. Um, but during that time, it, it gave us the opportunity to focus on the planning and on how else can we be doing things because it was exceptionally quiet, but we obviously have the demand coming back. Um, so we were focusing on recovery for quite a while but now we're thinking of a second wave so it, it's it's quite a challenge now i suppose in that we don't know what to ex uh, expect with the winter coming winters are normally quite difficult anyway um so we've got senior management working very hard to plan for the um, winter pressures alongside the risk of covid um so it, it's an ongoing thing we've also had webinars on a weekly basis initially and now um, fortnightly where our director would um speak to us cover, covering topics that um, are relevant to our, our roles and that information was fed back so we, we were able to interact with senior management in a way that we've never done before and um, that was very much welcomed by all um, so yeah we, we've had quite a lot of changes that we've had to to deal with and it, it has been very intense and, and quite incessant really but um, I, I, I think People have coped exceptionally well. I'm so proud of my team in particular, um, who have just just gone with the flow, and it's been it's been so great to see how they've adapted, and they've done really well. Thank you, Amanda. I, I, I remember when easement was first uh, introduced and the confusion about what it meant and how it was uh, going to be uh, act, um, enacted. Um, it, it, the digital factor is a, it's a common thread, isn't it, uh, across the board? Uh, and like like your like your team, I know as a school governor, there were teachers have been going out uh, during lockdown and and beyond to make sure that children of families who were in danger of um, pulling themselves mm. away from education uh, weren't allowed to um, uh, to do so. And it's amazing how much you've had to adapt to the scale. And of course, you'll rightly point out that um, dips and referrals is a 
is a warning light, isn't it? Mm, uh, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, and I didn't know that you dealt with uh, hoarding. That was interesting. That's, uh, that was yeah, really interesting. absolutely. I, th I think um, I, I had a, a big role in developing the hoarding <laughs> protocol in Suffolk. So um, I that was one of my biggest concerns because with hoarding, the risk can be high. The risk of death um, really can be quite high. And we rely on um, supplementing our assessments of need and risk with real world observation. So without that, you just don't know. And the difficulty with people who self neglect and hoard is that they don't, just by the very nature of self neglect, they, they don't necessarily um, come forward for that support. So we, we had to think of ways to identify who might be at most risk um, and to reach out to them. Um, so, you know, we hear about people not engaging, actually, it's about how are we reaching out to them and we had to think of ways to do that. Brilliant. Really good to hear. Thank you. Eula, so same question to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Andy, you know, the work that my colleagues and I do in, in the CCG lies at the heart of assuring frontline processes, as, um, you know, Amanda has talked about, um, and those systems that safeguard the health and well-being of vulnerable children and young people, including adults. Uh, we do have adults professionals within my team, uh, within our, our, our wider team in the CCG. I think what 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 we saw during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is is that you know our processes are predominantly face-to-face -face processes uh, to identify and assess those children and young people and and the question is what happens if all that is cut off and that's exactly what happened um, during COVID-19 and and I, and I talk about it as a shared loss with my colleagues uh, because you know. We, we were now confronted with uh, frontline teams who were not seeing children in the hospitals, uh, GPs not seeing children in the GP practices, um, professionals in schools, you know, not seeing children in schools. So these children became hidden from us. And that was a worry. Uh, you know, I think uh, everybody nationally, uh, including our regional teams and ourselves, you know, we, you know, we were really thinking, how does this pan out? And and I think for me and the team, this really made us start thinking about resilience and the children and families that um, are resilient in the face of safeguarding issues already. And, you know, we, we started to think about how do we think about accessing these children if this second, uh, uh, if this COVID-19 uh, comes back again and, and we have a second pandemic, how will we do things differently then? How will we ensure that, you know, these children are, are, are safeguarded and supported and, you um, I think what happened is that we quickly uh, started seeing children uh, via virtual methods. Um, I, I think in GP surgeries, they quickly moved on to virtual uh, video conferencing and, and, and video uh, uh, support, including our community hospitals and some was telephone contact as well. So that was um, something that really con we were confronted with a situation where it, it I don't think that, we, you know, we want it to happen again. <coughs> and it's about thinking. <coughs> Sorry. It's about thinking. Can we afford not to see these children? And actually, if we do have a second <coughs> lockdown, how do we see these children? Do we provide more PPE? Do we, you know, do we have teams that, that still go out? if there is a second lockdown. So it's really those things that we started thinking about and started rallying around our conversations in terms of our recovery plans as to how do we do this effectively and support the children who cannot afford not to be seen. I think I'll, I'll end there. Sorry, I'm causing Sorry. you to cough. I'm sorry. I'm, I'll, I'll hand you the virtual glass of water. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, that is, I, I love. I, I, I like what you said at the beginning, which is this this shared sense of loss of, yes. of not being able to see people face to face. Both those that, are, that rely on us to provide them with a service, or to intervene when need to, or to allow them to to empower them to live independently, but also our colleagues as well. Um, and that being a a driver for you as a team to try and find ways of bringing that back in in a safe way 
very important message. Thank you. Um, so last last question is about looking to the future. And really, this is a note for free for all, as I see it. Amanda, Bulard, I just want you to sort of have, a, have a conversation amongst yourselves. What, what do you think we should be learning for the future? Uh, what do you think we should be doing differently as a system? And I'll just take us back also to what you both referenced, which is Black Lives Matter. What are we, what are we missing? That kind of thing. Um, open to you, either of you, to, to, to kick things off. Um, I'm happy to 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 start off, uh, Amanda. I think for me, I wanted, I didn't want to give definitive statements of this is what we need to do, because I believe in the power of effective questioning, and the questions I really want to pose to system leaders and 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 you know and and ourselves as 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 um, senior system uh, leaders and managers and team managers in 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 our system locally, is you know have we been over reliant on our resilience? in certain areas of our work. So, for example, you know, we uh, we, we hear a, a lot of people talking about, you know, how resilient everyone has been. But there are also times where we need to think about resilience as having its own boundaries. What are those boundaries uh, uh, that we think when we reach a particular point that, you know, um, maybe resilience this is where the break point of resilience is. So it's really starting to think about what mechanisms should we put in place to support children and families and adults, uh, you know, in our communities before they reach that breaking point. And really starting to look at where are we vulnerable in our systems? Because we, 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 should, we should know this. We should know that these are our vulnerable points, that actually if another um, uh, pandemic breaks out, people go into lockdown, we can pinpoint that we need to fortify this area, this area. These are the areas that we know are have been vulnerable throughout the years and therefore any shockers that come in and stress the system, this could be our break, this could be where we have breaking points. So it's really us thinking in our uh, recovery plans about where those boundaries of resilience are. Can we have, can we, do we know when, when, you know, when families and children are, are reaching their breaking point? Some of those things, I think we really need to have honest and open conversations at our tables to think about, you know, yes, we have resilient families, we have resilient children, but specifically for us working in safeguarding and looked after children, um, um, we've seen that some of our families groups or our foster carer groups who have been resilient and have been coping very well uh, before the pandemic, but suddenly are thrown into a situation where they are vulnerable, where because there isn't any respite to support those mm -hmm. families, because everyone is shielding or some people are shielding, some people are, you know, are afraid to, 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 to have, um, you know, children and, and, and families in their respite placements what happens then so it's some of those things that we 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 think in how can we ask ourselves the difficult questions now before so we prepare for them i think for me those are really questions that i would want us to start thinking about because it's okay to say oh we've been so resilient and commend everyone for their resilience but people have breaking points and it's about how do we support people? How do we factor in some of those mechanisms to help families not to reach those points in the first place? Oh, right. I mean, resilience needs its own scaffolding, doesn't it? And that's, it does. Uh, yeah. yeah. Amanda? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, um, when, when I was thinking about this in terms of what we do for the future, I was thinking of what we've been doing during this um, crisis and what we can build upon in terms of those strengths um, that we've we've been um, harnessing. So, for, for example, the power of the digital technology, we, we just wouldn't have thought we would be where we are today. And we had um, plans, maybe five year plans to eventually, you know, be able to work from home and eventually do what we're doing right now. Um, but I don't think we've reached capacity with that. I think we need to maximise the use of digital 
digital technology even more to maximize um, choice for our customers and to mitigate the intrusiveness of our interventions. Um, so I know that for some people, they deem being in somebody's property face to face, seeing them is the gold standard. However, we need to find out from our customers, what do they prefer? Um, I find it quite liberating to be able to, I mean, I've had a meeting in the car because the building was shut down. <laughs> I was working in the building one day um, and I said, oh, just hold on. I'm, I'm going to tether to my phone and have the rest of the meeting in my car. So what can we be doing to free people up? Um, we've had the free me principle for a long time in Suffolk County Council. And here we are doing what we were hoping to do in the next five years now. Um, and also, I also think what we need to be doing as a council for us is to explore. Um, I spoke about that lull in demand at some point during the COVID crisis where we just didn't see the level of referral that we were seeing. We need to understand that a bit more. So to explore and understand what naturally occurring solutions people were calling upon and what strengths they relied upon during that time. Um, does that mean that it, it was just a delayed um, process where that maybe we missed a chance to be preventative does that mean that actually there are things that they they were relying upon in the community that they can continue to um, that we can build upon and support people to use those solutions um, and i also think we need to work um, harder on our integration agenda so Part of this um, crisis has delayed some of our plans with our integration agenda. So um, in the West Suffolk Alliance, we are trying to come together to have, we've got maturity matrices where we look at where we are in bringing our teams together, the integrated neighborhood teams and so forth. Um, so we've worked together in ways that we haven't before. Um, for example, cross-referencing our lists of people, looking at, um, what, what efficiencies we can find in the way we're delivering care. So at some point we expect that we may have um, maybe up to 30% um, or as low as 30% capacity in relation to our care provision and relation to the nurses maybe becoming sick and not being able to go out. And we, we cross-referenced our lists of people where the nurses are going out and carers are also going out and had plans in place if we were to reach a point where that... Um, the pressures meant that we couldn't go out to all the people. Um, obviously, it didn't get to that point. But if, if that had happened, we knew who those people were, where we, we could maybe um, come together and and um, sort of have maybe just one person rather than the carer going out and the nurse going out, just have one of those um, go out to save the capacity for elsewhere. Um, also think of the voluntary sector. So we saw a great um, sort of response from the vol voluntary sector um, and we had some volunteers in the home but not alone service for example which was fantastic however we were relying on um, furloughed staff who and people who would ordinarily be working and maybe not working at that time um, but people are now returning to the substantive posts. We don't quite have the home but not alone service anymore. We had our um, integrated neighbourhood team volunteers who've also gone back to work. So we need to be thinking of resilient ways to um, maximise that voluntary sector and to, to have um, that going forward. Um, and I think also thinking of the statistics, um, there's still a lot to be gleaned. Um, to tell us what, what's been happening and, and to shape our direction of travel, like Beulah said about um, the second wave. What have we learned from what happened initially and how can we respond better going forward? And we know, obviously, that COVID has had a massive financial stress on countries, on um, communities, on budgets. Um, so we need to know how we can do more with less and um, how, how we can be more resilient and a bit more creative with what we do and also some obvious things like being paper free <laughs> for my team for example at the moment we're thinking well we need to print stuff how can we do things differently how can we provide that information to people now that we're working from home so digital is great but we still have certain things that need to be signed um, how can we be a bit more creative um, and a bit more agile in how we how we do, do our jobs really. So there's a lot to be learned. And, and I love what Biula said about resilience because I think that is central to all we do really. Actually, mm. Andy, if I just say something um, which um, Amanda has reminded me of around digital. So we have made great strides 
in the COVID-19. But we must also be very mindful that we have pockets of poverty, places where people do not have digital access and people cannot afford digital products. And how do we ensure that we are not again starting to marginalize people further with our interventions. I think this is something that is really key, specifically for some of our children and young people who are in um, you know, our neglect uh, and abuse categories. A lot of those families are, are living in poverty. So it's really about how do we take on the digital agenda, but also be very mindful about um, the disadvantages that can happen within our communities. And this is something that we need to be transparent and talk about within our digital um, um, you know, meetings about the impact it has on families. So in, including all the ethnic minority families who are possibly in the deprived community uh, uh, categories as well. So it's something that we really need to, to, to keep raising the voice because sometimes um, a lot of the time we're hearing about the positivities only. And I think that has a potential to, um, you know, to make us forget that actually the impact will be much more detrimental if we um, charged on with, you know, making everything and making digital the first point of doing anything. Um, just to add that. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, going back to what Amanda was saying, uh, it's interesting. You want to be less intrusive, but more effective. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You only be more effective if you work with a wider uh, part of the system, including the voluntary community sector. And, mm -hmm. uh, digital and languages, you know, there are certain things, phrases that have come in during the last seven months that we've never used before. Uh, and, and one I hadn't heard before now was digital poverty. And that's what you're describing now, Beulah. So that 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 is an, an inherent um, uh, exclusionary factor, isn't it, for for um, people that uh, all of a sudden see everything seem to be moving to to that digital front, mm -hmm. uh, which is great for I don't know 80% of the population uh, because they can see their GP or their hospital consultant or um, or uh, their financier or um, mm. even a CAB uh, online. But when it comes to um, those who can't afford to, or those who are HD literate, um, uh, or, or those that just honestly need to see people for, first and foremost, because they're yeah. isolated, lonely, uh, all those factors. Um, what you've both described is a, is, a, is a very balanced view about the future, which I really appreciate. Thank you. Uh, any last final words that you want to? Um, so, I, yeah, so I, I think um, I'm, I'm very pleased to have come across so many different people, more so that I think than I would have um, done while if, if we were all working from the office as normal. It's quite strange that even though we're less visible, I think we're, we're more um, we're more available in a way and I hope that we don't go back into our respective silos where we just do our thing and sort of go off in different directions. Um, this has forced us all to work together as multiple organisations um, and there are people in my building in West Suffolk House who work on my floor who I have become I've been working with a lot more than I did when we sort of made a drink quietly next to each other at the breakout area so I think um, this has brought with it some great opportunities to network um, and to, to work together in a more positive way. Brilliant thanks Amanda. You there? I, th I think for me it's really um, commendable that as a system we have come together so well it during the pandemic, I, I, I don't I didn't even remember which organization I work for <laughs> because we were just hands on deck. And and it was amazing because we were all thinking out of outside the box and, you know, people were creative. And um, yes, I think that is such a commendable spirit because people just rallied on and and said, let's do this and that was the spirit we were working in and i really commend that and i was really proud to be a part of that as well yeah 
Absolutely. And also, obviously, you mentioned earlier, I don't think we came back to it um, respectively it, around the Black Lives Matter. So I think s th there has been a lot of progress. Maybe in my mind, I I I've spoken to Beulah and Tendai previously, where I've said, I think I had my head in the sand. I thought, well, this, you know, awful world stuff happens. And I I hadn't felt compelled to speak out about anything because I, I assumed there were people out there um, who would and who would f fight my corner. Um, and I think the difference this year um, in relation to how involved I've been with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the What Are We Missing movement, even though I've still been um, almost put forward, each thing I've done has been as a result of somebody else saying, why don't you, um, I think you'd be great to speak at this or why don't you speak at the webinar? Um, but I think the difference that has happened for me is that I, I have a child, I have a five-year-old son and I see him in all the awful things that have happened to all these people that have given rise to this um, uprising, I guess, is, is not a dramatic way of putting it. I think that's um, qu quite valid. So, yeah, I, I think for me, it's been, I've learned a lot, really. So there has been COVID happening, but for me, there's also been the Black Lives Matter, um, wh which um, has been hap happening in parallel. Um, and it, it, it has been, I think, quite stressful. But like I said, I've met some amazing people through it. Um, Beulet and I, yourself, and, you know, a lot of other people. And I'm just hopeful and I'm hoping that we see some progress. I'm very um, proud of the West Suffolk Alliance for everything they're doing to try and push the agenda forward um, as well um, within my own area. So, yeah. I'll say it, Amanda. Thank you both. Thank you, Andy. It's been a lo you. lovely to hear you both speak. Thank you. And and both of you and your parts that you're playing uh, in the What Are We Missing uh, initiative uh, are really, really prominent roles. And, and there's a growing number of us as well. That's the best part about it, isn't it? Yes. Absolutely, yeah. Very inspired by Beulah, and, and I think she, she knows that anyway. So I'm a bit starstruck when I speak to her about <laughs> no. the whole thing because I, I'm, I'm learning. I think we're at different stages in our journeys um, in dealing with all of that sort of stuff. So I'm learning a lot from Beulah and Tendai. So and yourself. Oh. But, um, I, I know I'm becoming a bit fangirl, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I, you know, I've been inspired by you, by you as well, Amanda. Honestly, everybody has been so inspired. And I think the fact that you are not a lone voice is something yeah. that gives courage and it has given me courage. But thank you so much for being so generous with your comments uh, about me. <laughs> thank you. are true, so thank you. Perfect place to leave it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>